Okay, so I know David's mentioned it a couple of times about the session. First of all, of course, this is here. Um, and yours has four different movements that it does. Okay, so first of all, it's at this tilt of approximately 23, 24 degrees. And what does this tilt give us? Very good. Because that's easy. Yeah. <laughs> if the earth was like this, any wherever you look, that your climate would pretty much be the same. There wouldn't be any season because of its tilt. Obviously, we're in the northern hemisphere, so we're facing closer to the sun. That's summer, and then uh, I'll explain it later. And then when we're farther away, so right now the sun's right there in the middle of the table. We're coming to this part. That's why here it's winter. We're farther away from the sun, and it's summer in the southern hemisphere because they're closer to the sun. No, we would fall off if it was straight. No. <laughs> Uh, they think the leading theory on why we got the 23 degree tilt is because uh, back in the early formation of the Earth from 4.56 billion years ago, uh, they theorized that a protoplanet called Thea collided with the Earth. So Thea was about a quarter of the mass of Earth and quarter size, so roughly around the size of Mars, hit into the Earth and chunks of the earth and Thea got vaporized and started going around the earth and that formed into the moon but that also gave us the tilt and various evidence that they used to show that that's what happened because there's material earth that makes up part of the moon and as well it has that that's thing we always see the same side of the face so it has the angular momentum from when it initially formed and it was uh, would have had to be outside the road limit so the road limit is I think on the Earth it's 15,000 kilometers. If there's debris within that, the Earth's gravitational pull will, will allow it to form into a moon or any other anything else. That's why if you see Saturn when it's rings, those that material is within the Roche limit. So it can't form into into moons. All the Saturn moons are outside the rings. Mm. So, so of course, if you have this one movement that gives us the well, it actually goes this way, gives us the day. Of course, everything's counterclockwise. Also goes around the sun counterclockwise. The second one, it also wobbles a little bit like this, about two degrees. <clears throat> and the fourth motion is perspective. So basically, the Earth does this big wobble, and that's the great year. So that's 25,920 years, I think. How many? Uh, usually just rough, even up to uh, 26,000. Um, for it to, to do that one that one spin um yeah 25,920 so so another way to look, think of it is that it's it's doing one of these as it goes around so what procession is is that if you picture Say this table is actually round and the sun is in the middle middle of the room. Okay. And so the earth would be on the edge of this round table. Now picture that on all the walls and on the ceiling and on the floor are all stars. Okay. So in the northern hemisphere, we'll be able to see most of the stars on the walls and on the ceiling. We'll be able to see those on the floor. So in the southern hemisphere, they can't see the ones on the ceiling. Okay, so what happens, as I said, as Earth, so right now, let's say we're on this side, so it's a, we're coming up on the first day of winter, and then it's going to be coming, doing its rotation here. Here we have the first day of spring, the equinox, and then we have the solstice, it makes its way around here, and then it makes its way back, fall equinox, and then once again, back to here. The winter solstice. So basically, when we look at it, when we talk about the ages, is that the sun's here, there's the vernal equinox. Basically, we can't not see any of the stars on that wall because of the sun. So as we're making our way, well, we can see all the stars behind us because it's the nighttime. And then now as we move around here, now we can see the stars. On those walls, but we can't see any the stars on that one. And then the same thing over here as we get over here. You can see all the stars on this wall and then on that wall. 
and then once again back to here. So we got to remember that as we're here, so right now, as it comes up to the spring uh, equinox, the sun, as we're rotating into it, we're going to see basically right now is Pisces. It's right there. Okay, so that's how we go. Um, sorry, forgot what it was exactly. I had it up. Right, so go to Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Cancer, Leo, Virgo. Uh, I memorized it so well. It was perfect when I tried it. Virgo, Libra, the Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, back to Pisces. Hey, you forgot all the <laughs> <laughs> so remember, so right now we're considering the age of Pisces because that's where that is that the sun is basically in that constellation on the spring equinox. Right now, it's slightly it's near the end, it's going to be going into Aquarius because don't forget now this is spinning, right? It's going in uh, it's going in counterclockwise counterclockwise direction, like everything else. And so as this is spinning, basically now our, our spring equinox, we're no longer right on. Now we're moving this way. So on the spring equinox, now it's going into Aquarius. And then as we continue the spin, basically it's going to make its way all the way around. Each age lasting approximately 2,160 years. 2,160, that's what a great year is 25,920 years. So it takes that long for it to make it play around the sun? Yeah. Doing this rotating. as it rotates. Of course, it does 265.24 days for one full rotation. But it's moving, it's doing this, this wobble at one degree per 72 years. So it's moving through that constellation. You will notice that it start moving one degree in a lifetime, basically. That is like being around 70, 70 years old. It's doing it very, very slowly. Now, how many years is that again? The great year is 25,920. And the month of the great year is 2,160. And it moves at 72 degrees. So 30, roughly 30 degrees is in each constellation. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Uh -huh. So that's how you get 2,160. And they're all, we call them processional numbers, they're all, also all sacred numbers. 72 equals nine. Two plus one plus six equals nine. Okay, cool. um, uh, two plus five plus nine plus two equals 18, which equals one plus eight equals nine. So oh, these are the sacred numbers. And yeah, that's okay. what we refer to as processional. You talked about that early too when we started. Yeah. Mentioned all this about the numbers. Too. So, so one way to look at it is that as well. So the earth, when they first, just something of interest to show. Goes around. So are you almost at that number? What's that? Is the almost at that number? We're, we're getting close. It's hard to tell because like, if you look at Pisces and Aquarius, it kind of overlap. Like if it's when exactly the uh, Pisces and Aquarius, some of them there's a big gap between the two. So how do you, you know, so that is a, not exactly precise, it's just an average. And that's one of the examples when you hit that number. Which they, sort of the, the, the theory is, I mean, the last time yeah. as we were talking about, yeah. the stars a little bit different. Right? The, the falling, that's going to down by the dragon, down. right? The meteorite, okay. it's a comet. Okay. And that's what okay. caused the last, which they think the scientists right. proving right. caused the last cataclysm, was a comet, exactly. or multiple like, comets, right until you actually right. caused the massive floods, which is why actually falling is all water. I think that's so North America and most of the world is under one of the massive floods from the ice sheets rapidly melting. Yeah. From the yeah. common yeah. impact. Yeah. Possibly yeah. also yeah. coronal mass yeah. again. Oh, <laughs> um, oh, yeah, sorry. So the official, what they say, well, what your sign is, is based on these dates. So like Sagittarius on the 22nd to December 23rd. However, when this was developed, this system, um, 
We weren't in Pisces. We were in Aries. Okay. So now, because we're over here, as it's going away, the sun is in that constellation. It's a bit off. So actually, these, once you take into consideration, today, um, what did it say? Uh, December 13th? December 13th. 14th. 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 December 14th. So if you're born today on December 14th, you're actually Ophiuchus. Or Scorpio. If you're doing just considered 12, you'd be Scorpio. If you consider 13, be Ophiuchus. Um, I'm Ophiuchus. Me too. Now, there's two things. <laughs> two two oh, thoughts on this. So I'm not a Scorpion, really, then? <laughs> there's two thoughts on it. Some are, you know, this. This is the good one. That's okay. I know, like in India, okay. they believe that it's it, it's tied more to the stars. Some people believe it's tied more to the seasons of the actual seasons of the earth. Mm. Whichever, I'm not saying that one's right, one's wrong. That's whatever you believe. You know. Yeah. I know David. I think believes more of the the stays as with the official. So the star the signs coming from the constellation. Yeah, no, that's the that's the official one. Or well, that's what the, the one that they use today when you read the news. Yeah, yeah. But if you take an account, where is the sun it on is. your birthday? It's not going to be in that constellation yes, because of yes. perception. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now I've started because David keeps, keeps talking about it, so I started reading Hamlet's Mill, and. I think I got up to chapter six so far. And so you think of it as it's doing this wobble, it's basically tracing in the sky. So like right now, right now, uh, the North Star is Polaris. By the year 14,000, it's gonna be the star of Vega. It's gonna be the North, the North Pole because it's moving like this. So it's going around the sky, it's tracing the circle in the sky. So according to, the Dogon people in Hamlet's Mill, this is in Hamlet's Mill, but I think it ties into something that we were discussing okay. a couple of times, that this might be why we say this, um, is that they say because of that motion, the, so Dogon people are in Northwest Africa, right? So they pass on this knowledge and they call it the cosmic tree. Oh. And it's on the earth and then upside down, so this is the tree of whites. They're so saying the tree is upside down. Mm -hmm. It's because of procession and this. Uh, yeah, so but, but potentially that might be one of the reasons yes. why we, we say that it's we're talking about procession as well. And right, and we, story is saying that that it's gonna it's what's there is what's it's mirror is, is gonna be exactly they saw the name of here, the yeah. tree. Sorry, look at the mirror of the, the tree. Yeah. Oh my so, god. So yeah, just with that. If it's okay, Dave, I, I just have two slides oh. that picks up from last week. I'm just going to go through those two slides and then the other stuff I didn't know, so I'm going to leave that to you. Next week. Sounds great. Yeah, I've got a little presentation and I got on as quick as I could so that we can get okay, to yeah. the story. Yeah, so just a quick from when we started last week, that's when she started with the fall. And so I believe. That this is at this time being represented by the constellation Virgo. As you can see, it looks like they're falling. And as it's going, as it's descending, so it's actually going to be descending towards the west. And once again, it gets escorted down only halfway by Gahasadine, which is the meteor or, yeah. or the dragon. Yeah. And also be the dragon. Yeah. But it only after echoing her down halfway. Okay. So between where Virgo's at the peak of its summit there, where it's going to be in the sky, and halfway between as it's going this direction, as it's going to set, halfway between the Tizinsu and the Earth is the constellation Hydra, which oh. could also be the dragon. So I believe that the that's representing there. Yeah. In the Seneca version as well, like you talked about that the dried dry, you know, meteor gave, gave her dried meat and dried food. Mm -hmm. In that Seneca version that I read, I think it was Johnson, if I recall, 
Uh, he also said that he, uh, the dragon gives her a mortar, a mortar okay. and pestle, which could be a consolation for a uh, crater. That could represent a mortar. Okay. Then it said that the dragon got her to see her flew away. And then what was left was the bittern mm -hmm. looking up and was the first one to notice her. Yeah. So a little later on in the night, as she begins to fall to earth, the dragon has flown away. It's now gone below the earth. And looking directly up is the constellation Corvus, which is usually pictured at a crow. Oh, wow. And he's looking directly he's up looking right at, at her. So you can see there's the tail, there's the beak, there's the legs. And so he's looking, and even one of the versions of the story even says bitter, and then in brackets says he who's always looking up. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, that's what I think what, what that's representing uh, right now. So that's what I got, David. I will make you the host. I like it. Nice analysis, Kyle. Okay. We're the host. I'm going to mute unless somebody has questions. Sounds good. And it's good to be here with everyone. And I do want to try and make it interactive as much as I can, but also I want to also go quickly through it. So, um, you know, if, if anybody wants to jump in, please do. And I will say right off the bat that Kyle just gave a great analysis of what is really a difficult passage to analyze. And so I'm going to show some analysis. You know, it took, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this in preparation. And I didn't really know where I was going to go with the analysis because Sometimes there's a lot of clues and we can be confident and sometimes there's fewer clues. And so I'm not, you know, just going to give you off the top of my head. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and back it up with some evidence what, I, what I'll say for my analysis, but sometimes there's more clues and sometimes there's fewer. So this time there's not always enough clues to be super confident. And so maybe some of my analysis will be different from what well, I know some of it's different from what Kyle just showed you, but those are good arguments. I like the crow looking up, Corvus, the crow looking up and the, next to the basket of crater on the back of the serpent. That's, that's good analysis. Um, what I'll say is, as I was, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to go through this with you because um, by being invited to this workshop, I've been, you know, pressed up a against the creation story, the Onondaga creation story, the Mohawk and the Iroquois creation story to a level that I wouldn't maybe otherwise, because it's difficult. I might've said, oh, there's not enough here for me to really write about confidently. But since I have to you know, give a presentation, it forces me to really think and soak on it. And I saw some things that I didn't expect to see that are really actually quite amazing. So I'm about to share those with you. And like I said, these may be right, these may not be right, because we don't always have enough details to be confident. I usually like two or three pieces of evidence, and I'll show you what I mean. But sometimes, especially when something didn't get written down, if it was passed down orally, we could say that maybe, you know, those storytellers down through the generations of your people passing them down, they may have had certain details that maybe when they got written down, didn't get captured. Maybe, maybe many of them did, but maybe sometimes something that I would say, ooh, that's a really important little detail. I'm glad that was there. Maybe the person writing it down or somehow it didn't get into the written part. So, um, all I'm saying is, I'll show you what I have come. Yeah, Rhonda has a question. Think about it. Yeah, go ahead, Rhonda. I just want to re um, solidify what you're saying because um, I have a really close relationship with some of the Hopi people, mm. and they will always tell you a little bit, 
but mm. there's things that they will not tell you <laughs> if you're not from them or especially if you're a non-native person to who might be writing or asking them questions mm -hmm. so I'm positive that there's probably keys somewhere in the universe that we got to grab back out of the air that weren't written down or even may have been lost through the oral tradition like being attacked so strongly by uh, colonization so you're you're right on the money with that mm -hmm. Right. So I agree. And, um, you know, we know that John Arthur Gibson was a native, you know, indigenous of, of what he was trying to preserve, but still some things may have gotten lost. You know, I don't know, but what I'm going to do is try and add some, um, some of my perspective from looking at lots of different myths around the world. And what was amazing to me is I found some helpful clues among myths of ancient Japan and myths of ancient India, which, you know, the conventional paradigm of ancient history would not expect those or would say, well, those can't possibly be helpful. But in fact, what I've found over and over down through the years that I've been doing this now for, I think, 14 years, looking at lots of different myths is there was some kind of ancient worldwide system that they're all part of a common language of the stars. And so you can just see what you think of the evidence I come up with. But what I'm saying is I was very um, pleased and surprised at some of the connections that I didn't expect that may help add a little bit of insight, hopefully, um, into what we're hearing about. But anyway, it's really wonderful to go through this and to hear it as Trina's reading it, and then to contemplate it. So I just want to share what I've put together here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And when I do that, and I believe we're on week eight, if I'm counting correctly. Today's the 14th of December, as I heard Kyle was talking about it when I first came on. Actually, week nine. Oh, we week nine? So somehow I've messed up my count. Um, the last one is week 10. So. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, I better go fast so we can get through everything by week 10. I thought we were on week eight. Okay. So as I was just saying, I found some very amazing connections from myths of Japan and myths of India that are just help, help us as we try and analyze this particular part of the story. But I'm not saying that I am right, quote unquote, I'm offering some perspectives. So I focused in on, here's a section from the John Arthur Gibson version that Trina translated and sent to me before we started this. And here's some of the parts that we heard where Yotsitsizo was, uh, became pregnant. And as the time grew near for her to give birth, her husband had a dream and he wanted people to come and guess the dream. And a feast took place and everyone came to try and guess Arundade's dream. Nobody could cause his mind to be appeased. But then Gahasarine arrived and said, let me attempt to guess correctly the meaning of your dream. And Gahasarine said, surely is it not that your life has the need for the standing tree to be uprooted? And Arundade declared that he was thankful. The dream guessing right had been fulfilled and he disclosed the details of the dream. So there's Gahasarine. I just circled that part. We're going to uproot the standing tree. We've already spent a lot of time talking about where that standing tree could be. I've given a lot of evidence that I think it's on top of Ophiuchus, where Hercules looks like the whirling version of Hercules. So I didn't actually draw that out. It is in the recorded things that we've talked about, where I talked about, you know, could Rarundade be Balodes, guardian of the standing tree? We've already looked at it, but I believe that fits in with everything I'm going to talk about in a little bit here. And then I showed one more little piece of the text here before I'm going to get into some clues to help us. Then a group of men that, that were there 
set in motion the particulars of Arundhati's dream. They uprooted the standing tree, creating a hole at its base. Then there, Arundhati and his wife sat eating the food which she had prepared. Arundhati revealed to his expectant wife that now surely all that exists in their world would become new again. This theme of renewal. Creation that's ongoing, becoming new again. I think that's really important for our lives individually and for our world. Furthermore, he stressed that it will all come about, all of which will be created below will think of this place. This has something to do with that, that other realm below. And then right after that, Rarundade sends her down to that other realm, quite shocking and a little bit violent. He placed his hand at the nape of his wife's neck and thrust her into the chasm. Then the men assembled, stood back up the tree. So what to do with this? Where, where is she if, if the tree is Ophiuchus or, or Hercules on top of Ophiuchus together as the tree and they're ripping it up? Well, I found some help in a place that we might not expect, but that I remembered from examining the myths of ancient Japan I've written about. In this book I wrote in 2019 called Ancient Worldwide System, I have different chapters on cultures around the world and a few chapters on the myths of ancient Japan, which are recorded in a text called the Kojiki. And those are the characters, the Chinese characters, and also Japan uses mostly the same Chinese characters um, with some variations. And so these characters mean the same thing in Chinese and in Japanese, but they just pronounce, they have different sounds that they say with those writings. So this is, this record is called the Kojiki. I just want to introduce it because it's beautiful that we're finding these clues around the world. And I just want you to know a little bit about this. You know, as I've researched it, I found it really fascinating. These words mean in Japanese, that first symbol it means old. The, the word is ko in Japanese. In Chinese, there's Mandarin, which is Putonghua, and Cantonese, which is Guangdonghua. I've studied only a little bit of it, but I find it really intriguing. They use picture symbols, which is really intriguing. Um, so that same symbol in Mandarin and Cantonese is both pronounced gu or go. And they both mean the same thing. It's old, old or ancient. And then the next word is G in Japanese. In Mandarin, it's Xi. In Cantonese, it's Si. And that means matters or things, business. You know, old stuff, old business, old matters, old things. This is, we're talking about the ancient times. And then Ki, or in uh, Mandarin, it's G. And in Cantonese, it's Ge. That in English means the record or the diary or the chronicle or the inscription. So the writings of the old things is this record called the Kojiki. And in the Kojiki, there's a specific character that I want to focus in on. And his name, there it is in Japanese characters, is Susanoo. Susanoo. And he is like a his name means like brave male figure. Um, just like some of the characters that we're meeting, their name you know, tells that they're male or female. Same thing with Susanoo. He's a male figure who's brave, but he's also impetuous. He's like, he, he just flies off and does unpredictable and sometimes random and bizarre things. And so I'm just going to focus in on one little part of the Kojiki where Susanoo, it's actually a really important episode. I won't go into the whole thing, but he, his name is translated. This is a 1919 translation by, uh, I forget his name. I think Basil Chamberlain, 1919. His swift, impetuous male Augustness, that's how they translate Susanoo. But here's what he does. As the Heaven shining great august deity, that's his sister, Amaterasu, the sun, the, the sun goddess. His sister, she's sitting in her awful weaving hall. This is important. Uh, these are clues for us. A weaving hall where she's sitting there weaving. 
the august garments of the deity. So she's weaving the clothing for the gods. He broke a hole in the top of the weaving hall and through it let fall a heavenly piebald horse, which he flayed with a backwards flaying. And everyone's saying, what does this have to do with what we're reading? I'll, I'll get into it. He broke a hole in the top of the weaving hall. Through the hole, he let fall a heavenly piebald horse. That means like a speckled horse, which he had flayed. Flaying, of course, means skinning. He had skinned it. He'd taken the skin off of it in a special way, not just taking the skin off it. He didn't just flay it. He flayed it with a backwards flaying, and he let it drop through the hole. And then it says, at whose sight the women weaving the heavenly, heavenly garments. So it's Amaterasu, the goddess, and her other women are weaving in the weaving hall, and this impetuous male deity breaks a hole in the roof, throws a flayed horse down into the weaving hall. They get so upset it says they were so very much alarmed that, and then <laughs> this is what they would do in 1919 uh, when they were talking about delicate or sexual things. They would write it in Latin so that kids couldn't <laughs> know what it said. They were so much alarmed that they impegarunt privitas partes adversus radius et obierunt. And I'm not, I don't really speak Latin, but basically it says they jabbed their weaving shuttles into their private parts and died. Bizarre. What is going on? Well, this is what happens sometimes in myths where it's based on the stars and it's kind of like the book of Revelation. There's not necessarily a lot of context always given and you're like, whoa, what is this? Am I, am I going crazy? It's based on the stars. I'm not going to get into all the pieces here, but these are going to give us important clues, I believe, for what's going on in this amazing creation story, the Iroquois creation story. So, um, and the thing is, the Kojiki was written down. It, it was written down. So we do have right here, I believe, enough clues to be confident. Like certain things have been preserved that are important to help figure it out for the stars. Like the horse was flayed backwards. Because that was preserved, I can be confident in the interpretation that I'm about to give you. And then I can say, let me see if this could possibly ap apply to what happens to Yotsi Tsizo when she falls down the hall. So we looked at this before. I show, I'm showing like a big arc of the Milky Way, all the way from Sagittarius and Scorpio on the right hand side as we look at it, arcing across all the way over to the Great Square. I introduced the Great Square last time when we were talking about the lacrosse field or a couple of weeks ago, I want to look at it again. There's the great square. We, we see that the great square is attached to Pegasus. It's attached to Pegasus, the winged horse. So in Greek mythology, Pegasus springs out of the neck of Medusa. And we talked about how that clearly is shown here in the stars springing out of the neck. On the other side is the beautiful Andromeda, but that is envisioned as a wing, but could it be envisioned as the skin of that horse if you're flaying the horse? If anyone's, you know, ever done any taxidermy and had the skin like a deer, or if you, you know, skinned a deer or a, uh, another animal and you peel the skin off, this horse was peeled, its skin was peeled off a certain way, backwards, it's like it was peeled off of his butt. Look, the wing or the great square of Pegasus is coming off the rump of the horse. This is the backward flayed horse. I'm quite confident that this is the backward flayed horse that Susanoo throws down through the hole. So I believe that this could be a clue that could help us. And he broke a hole in the top of the weaving hall. So let's see what that could be. But in the Japanese myth, he throws a horse. In the Iroquois creation story, who gets thrown through the hole? It's not a backward flayed piebald horse. No, it's Yotsitsitsu by Arundade. So I believe Andromeda 
who looks like she's falling could be Yotsi Tito being thrown through the hole by Rarundade at the beginning of the part that we're looking at. And the hole could be the great square at the top of the weaving hall. We'll get into the weaving hall in a minute. In the Japanese myth, we're told that it's in the top of the weaving hall. So let's just see if this can help us. But can everyone see how Andromeda might look like a you know, beautiful woman who's falling almost head first towards that square hole? And her legs are sticking up towards the upper left. Her head is touching the corner of the great square. Pardon? Oh, no, we're, we're all oh, okay. Right. Okay, great. So hopefully everyone's still in agreement with me. Well, who's throwing her through then? Maybe it could be, it could be in this case, you see Andromeda falling through the great square. I've just zoomed out a little bit. Next to Andromeda, he's a little bit cut off, but that is Perseus. He looks like he's giving her a push. Now I agree, he doesn't have his hand on her neck, but she's falling through the hole. So I, I'm, you know, like I said at the beginning, I'm not positive about all these identifications, but I am confident about that backward flayed horse in the story of Susanoo because of what I showed you. And therefore, I think it's a good possibility that when Yotsuzizo falls through the hole down to the next, the realm that we're all in, it may start here. Okay. And now let's find out what could be the weaving hall. This is something I'm very confident with, again, because I've looked at myths around the world. And I'm just going to say, and I'll show a little bit of evidence, but I have seen abundant evidence that Ophiuchus, that important constellation that plays so many different important figures, can be envisioned as a loom for weaving a loom for weaving. This is a Navajo loom. This is an actual photograph from Canyon de Chez in the late 1800s. I think it was colorized later. I think it was a black and white photograph and somebody decided to go in and you know put some colors on there. I don't know if that's the actual colors of what they were weaving, but look at the, this is one picture of a loom. I've done presentations where I've shown you know 10 different looms. Sometimes looms have do have a triangular top but they almost always have like a ladder shape or a very, you know, very straight pillars on either side. And then you weave by moving the shuttle in between those vertical strings and creating the pattern that you want to create. And then you batten them down with a stick that's called a batten. And that's how you weave. And so look at Ophiuchus, look at the loom. And I'll tell you that Ophiuchus as a loom I'm very confident in saying it because I've seen it in Greek myth, like over and over in Greek myth. In the Odyssey, almost every time they come up to a new goddess, she's weaving at the loom and singing. And they're like, ooh, it sounds like the goddess is inside weaving at the loom. There's weaving all over throughout the Odyssey and other Greek myths. But there's also in Norse myths, there's a Jotun, a giant whose name is Mighty Weaver. And he's associated with Ophiuchus. Like what I'm saying is I've got lots of evidence to back up my assertion that Ophiuchus is a loom. And so <laughs> who's weaving at the loom? It's Sagittarius. So I've circled both Sagittarius and Ophiuchus. Why, is Sagitt why am I confident Sagittarius is weaving at the loom? Well, this is one picture of an ancient shuttle. There's different you know, shapes that you can make the shuttle. Some look a little more wide or wider on one end than the other, but you basically put the string on the shuttle and you it, it's shaped kind of like a missile so you can move it in and out of the strings. And that's where we get our word shuttle, like for the space shuttle is from weaving. So look at that shuttle and then look at a, a Sagittarius. She's normally envisioned as carrying a bow, but can you see how that bow resembles, if you're creative and imaginative, a shuttle? because she's right next to the loom in the heavens. She's pointing that shuttle towards the loom. It even looks like there's string hanging off of the sides of Ophiuchus. I mean, I'm quite confident that this is the weaving. So now we know that if in the Japanese record of the Kojiki, the backwards flayed piebald horse goes through the hole 
down to the weaving hall, we've got an idea of the direction. Anyway, there's Ophiuchus as a loom. There's the shuttle, in case you weren't sure what I was talking about. The shuttle is the bow. Look at how it looks like the shuttle. So now this helps us to unlock at least my interpretation. It's a little different from Kyle's. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm giving my arguments, but I find some things about this very satisfying and intriguing. We'll see. Um, it's just something to have as a resource. So now we know, okay, we're starting at this hole where she, you see her falling, Andromeda. Yotsitsizo starts there. She gets pushed by Rurundade down to that next world. So there's the Milky Way. I'm just going to highlight it so that everyone can see the arc of the Milky Way. And you can see that basically Rurundade, if Perseus is Rurundade throwing her down, we talked about earlier that Rurundade might be over at Balodis, but this is not uncommon for um, you know, figures to move around through different constellations in different parts of the story sometimes. So I'll take away the Milky Way. I just wanted to show you where it is. So that means she probably is being pushed from the region of the Great Square in Andromeda down to this region of Ophiuchus and Sagittarius. Because why am I saying that? Because that's what happened in the Japanese myth. The piebald horse went from the Great Square and Pegasus down through the weaving hall and all the women did this weird thing and jabbed their shuttles into their private parts. Like, what is that? Well, if nothing else, it is an indication of where we're talking about. Oh, okay, I know, Sagittarius. So we're talking about a falling down in this direction, down towards Sagittarius and Ophiuchus. Got it. So could that be the same direction that Yotzitzitzo falls when she gets pushed through the hole? Because as she falls along the Milky Way, she's going to go right past. I've talked about these two great birds of the Milky Way before. Cygnus, the swan, and Aquila, the eagle, or Aquila, the eagle. In Spanish, the word for eagle is aguila. So those are actually very big, beautiful constellations. They look a little small because constellations in the center of this Stellarium map look a little smaller. They are big, they're beautiful, they're noticeable, and they're right in the Milky Way. And if she's falling that way, she will go through those two. And so as, as I read the story and pondered it, the bittern and the loon are saying, oh, we've got to help this being falling from the sky. And the first ones who try and help are the ducks. And they say, oh, let's see if we can. It actually says they join their bodies together. And so I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see who the ducks might be. I'm not positive about any of this, but I'm going to make some arguments. Here's a picture of a bittern. And I'm just showing it next to Cygnus and Aquila or Aquila. And I agree with Kyle, the text clearly tells us, or the, you know, the account as written down by John Arthur Gibson clearly tells us that it's the bittern who looks up and sees her first. And you can see this, the way the bittern flies, look, looks like they're looking up the way a bittern, here's another, the one on the left is called a cinnamon bittern. And I think it's found in Asia. The one on the right is a North American bittern, but they kind of stand around like they're looking up and so I agree with Kyle that they do look a lot like the constellation Corvus the crow. But because I'm arguing that she's falling in this direction that I just showed you, she would crash through or go past Cygnus and Aquila. So you can decide for yourself which one you think might be a bitter and which one you think might be a loon. But here I found an American loon. Um, sometimes they have you know really beautiful spots and coloration, but... I chose this one. Why? Because I like the way it's standing there. It looks to me like Aquila, and the bittern looks to me like Cygnus. But I could be wrong because Aquila is, you know, looking more up, and Cygnus is looking more down. But either way, her path of falling, if I'm right, goes past these two. And so, therefore, where are the ducks? 
I don't know where the ducks are, but they're the first ones. So maybe they're before Cygnus and Aquila or Aquila. And the story does say they tried to join their bodies together. I don't know what that means. I mean, I guess they, they did a huddle. They did a, you know, they did a scrum. They all pressed up together like in rugby. Well, the fishes of Pisces, I've outlined them there in pink, so they stand out, are joined together, but they weren't able to stop her fall. So they were like the first ones. Maybe the two fishes of Pisces or the ducks joining together. That's a long shot. I don't have enough clues to be able to say, oh yeah, for sure, these are the ducks and these are the bittern. I'm giving you my best estimates of possibilities. If she starts at Andromeda, maybe those are the ducks, but I'm not positive. And then I like what Kyle thought about Gaha Serene, you know, the meteor, the dragon, the constellation Hydra, but I'm um, looking at a different falling path here. So I'm starting her off at Andromeda and going towards Ophiuchus. And so I had to look halfway because Gaha Serena clearly says, I'll go with you halfway. So I looked halfway and I found from the Great Square and Andromeda down to Ophiuchus, who's halfway? Halfway between Andromeda and Ophiuchus, there's a couple, you know, potential male figures in between of, in between Andromeda and Ophiuchus. Hercules, that constellation we've talked a lot about, is underneath the bittern, but Hercules is right on top of Ophiuchus. It's very close to Ophiuchus. I wouldn't call that halfway. I would suggest that as a possibility, Gaha Serene could be the figure who's halfway between Andromeda and Ophiuchus, Aquarius, the water bearer, who looks like he's carrying a basket or a bucket, and there's water streaming out of it. So, you know, a meteor or a comet looks like it has hair trailing out behind it. Aquarius does sometimes play the role of a figure carrying a water bucket and pouring out water for sure, or pouring out wine sometimes too. But sometimes Aquarius is carrying a severed head. You know, there's all kinds of myths where some monster's head gets cut off or, you know, other heads get cut off. And Aquarius could be carrying a head where blood or hair is streaming out of it. You can see that if you look at Aquarius. So I know Gaha Serene is associated with a meteor, maybe associated with a dragon too. That's not necessarily Aquarius, but Aquarius is halfway. And as you mentioned, Kyle, he does share a basket of food with her and he is halfway. So I'm just suggesting as a possibility with a question mark, could it be that that's Gaha Serene if she is following, starting at Andromeda, heading towards Ophiuchus? And so I'll just move those birds out of the way and talk a little bit more about this episode and as we get to the animals that try and help her because the loon and the, uh, I think it's mostly the loon that says, we've got to help this being. And so there's part about Gaha Serene saying, I will accompany you halfway Basically, she nodded in acknowledgement. And he says something really important in this middle paragraph that I put up there that I think is very, very revealing and possibly super helpful to us in this world. He says, know that it won't be long before it will come to pass that this place will be a reflection of the place from where you have come. So Gaha Serena says, I can only go this far. You shall come through this ordeal in a positive way. I should have read the whole quote, so I'm reading it now. You shall come through this ordeal in a positive way by using your own power. This is a very profound thing. If, if this is talk, talking about being cast down into this world where we are, the last heavenly being that's accompanying her on the way down says to her, I can only go with you this far, but you, you shall come through this ordeal in a positive way by using your own power. You're not going to rely on me. 
you're going to do it. And know that it won't be long before it will come to pass that this place, he's talking about the place you're going, will be a reflection of the place from where you have come. As above, so below. That's the pattern. The pattern in the heavens sets the the right pattern for what we should be trying to make this place where we are. Something about following those heavenly cycles and bringing them down into our lives. Just like you were sharing with us last week, Trina was sharing with us about what she does every full moon. The cycles above are coming down into our world below. And we are supposed to establish a right society down here by following that heavenly pattern. I am really a strong believer that these myths are for our own personal benefit, individually, recovery of self, healing of trauma. But also, that's not all. They're also for healing the world. They're for the right way to establish an orderly, positive society where everybody benefits and is uplifted. It's not just, okay, these are just for me. I'm just going to, you know, worry about me and, uh, you know, I can't fix the world. No, they're for both. They're for the pattern for us as individuals, but also the pattern for society. I've talked a little bit and mentioned, you know, uh, the ancient societies all established their patterns based on the stars. The they would set out where the different tribes were. Even in the Bible, it says, you know, these tribes were on the north, these tribes were on the east, around the central place. That is a pattern of the heavens. The 12 on the outside with the 13th in the middle. That is a pattern of the heavens, and we find it around the world. I've mentioned this book called The 12 Tribe Nations. It show, it's by John Michel and a co-author. And it shows that this pattern was found around the world in the North America, South America, Madagascar off the coast of Africa, other parts of Africa, Iceland, Greece, in the Bible, everywhere. So what is Gaha Serene saying? You're going down to that earthly realm where we are right now. I can only go with you so far, but you're going to be okay you're going to come through this ordeal. It might be a bit of an ordeal, but it's going to be a positive. And you're going to use your own power, not me. You're a power. But here's the pattern. Make that place a reflection of this place. It will come to pass. That's really amazing. But also, it also helps as one more piece of evidence. Okay, if she's falling from Andromeda towards Ophiuchus, we just spent a bunch of time talking about, you know, Rarunda Day and the downfended children. It was all around Ophiuchus. Now she's getting thrown down and she ends up where? <laughs> right back in the same, oh, we're going to make the earth is going to be centered around the same thing that the heavenly adventures were centered around. So maybe this interpretation gives us some positive lessons. I don't know. I didn't expect to find any of this. I'm telling you, a week ago, I was like, oh boy, Kyle said, David, I want you to <laughs> do some of this. I'm not sure about these. I said, okay. <laughs> and I started looking and thinking about it, and I looked at the Kojiki, and I said, wow, maybe this is what's going on. And halfway, he can only go halfway, and then it's going to be a reflection. And look, they're right back around Ophiuchus again. It's as above, so below. It's really quite profound, I think. So let me talk about a couple more things. Um, I'm just getting these constellations back on here. Oh, yeah. Now we've got the, uh, the muskrat. So how are we going to get how are we going to help her? She's coming down. He said, this is going to be an ordeal. You're going to you're going to you're going to get down there. And don't worry, you will come through it. But it's going to be an ordeal. I can't help you. The ducks tried to stop her. They couldn't. And Loon says, can't we help this? Make some, maybe, maybe we can, you know, have a place for her where, you know, we're water birds. We're a bittern and a loon. Muskrat says, maybe I'll dive down and get some earth for her and bring it up. And he dives down and he's gone a long time. And finally, they're like, uh, what happened to Muskrat? Who could that be? I'm going to move a little faster here. 
Um, I think Beaver goes down maybe to find him or anyway, whenever they find him, he's dead. He stayed down too long, but he did manage to bring up some earth in his paws and in his mouth. They found he, he died. But look at the shape of a muskrat. There's a picture of a muskrat. Look at the constellation Virgo. Now I know Virgo, everyone thinks, must be a beautiful woman. Yes, but interestingly enough, I've found abundant evidence, again, from myths around the world, that Virgo sometimes is like a goddess or a woman who has a rodent head. And you can see why the, the head of Virgo is kind of long with almost like a pointy nose. I know it sounds weird, sounds funny, and you're saying, oh, come on, I don't believe that. Please back that up with some evidence. There's a myth from Australia that I wrote about all the way back in 2016, where there's a moon man and a bandicoot woman. The bandicoot woman, I said, well, that must be Virgo. I thought the moon man was Bolotes. They, they're part of a story about the discovery of fire. And look at the bandicoot. It's got a pointy nose. He actually, you know, this bandicoot looks like Virgo. It's about the same shape and, and uh, pointy nose. There's a bandicoot woman, there's Virgo. And from the Maya, in the Popol Vuh, there's an important goddess who's called the White Kawadi goddess. She's one of the creator goddesses in the Popol Vuh of the Maya. This is a Kawadi Mundi. I've actually seen them when I went to the, uh, with the army to Panama, not in 1989 when the U.S. invaded Panama. I won't get into that. I went in 1992 to um, jungle school, and we were out in the jungles of Panama, and there's these animals that run around. They look like a kind of a raccoon. They move in packs. They're very smart. They do all kinds of amazing things. Sometimes they're just called a kawadi or a kawadi mundi, or in the army, a lot of guys pronounced it kuda mundi. I don't know if that's right or not. I've heard it pronounced like kawadi or kawadi mundi on like nature channel and stuff, but that's a Kawadi Mundi. There's a goddess named the Kawadi goddess. Look at Virgo, look at the Kawadi Mundi, look at the muskrat. I'm arguing that Virgo could be the muskrat. Am I positive about any of this? I'm not positive. I'm giving you clues that I found and some perspective from other myths that I've looked at. There's how you spell Popol Vuh. It's the book of the ancient matters of the Maya. The word vuh actually means book. And it's interesting because it almost sounds like book. V, vuh becomes like book, the ancient book. Anyway, I didn't make that up. There's a scholar who translated it and who said that. But I'm arguing that Virgo could be the muskrat. And when she comes up, or when the muskrat comes up, he's dead. Here's a picture. Oh, I'll show you a picture of a dead muskrat in a minute. She's got mud in her paws. Now, this is a long shot, but Virgo's outstretched arm is stretching towards this constellation Coma Berenices, which is kind of like a cluster of little beautiful stars, almost like a pom-pom. Do I think it looks like mud? No, I do not. I don't know what to do with this part about the mud, but <laughs> I just show you that Coma Berenices is there, or Berenices, I guess it's pronounced Coma Berenices. It means Berenices hair or Berenices hair. I don't think that's the mud really, but maybe I just put it in there for your uh, consideration, but I'm going to show you a dead muskrat. There's an actual picture of a dead muskrat that I found on Wikimedia Commons in the public domain. I mean, look at Virgo. She's on her back as she goes across the sky for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. Her legs are elevated, sticking up and a little bit apart. Look at that dead muskrat. It's got like one arm sticking up and the two feet sticking up. That's a dead muskrat. So I think Virgo is a possible, pretty strong contender. And then who could be the beaver? Well, beavers have a nice fat tail. And uh, so we've looked at this constellation before, lupus. Lupus does look like it kind of has a fat tail, maybe. You could think of that. He dives, what does he do? He, um, oh, he, he, they say, hey, let's put the dirt on beaver's back. Beaver says, you can try and put the, the earth on my back, maybe that'll support her. And they put the earth on Beaver's back and he goes, I can't handle it, it's too much. Don't put her on, on my back because I can't even carry this, this dirt without her. So then along comes 
snapping turtle, the powerful uh, turtle. And he says, oh yes, I am able to handle the earth on my back. And in fact, even if the earth should grow, I can grow with it. I can handle it. So who could be the mighty turtle who carries the earth on his back? We know it's not beaver. Uh, so it's not lupus down there below. I'm going to argue, well, I'm going to use a myth from ancient India. I thought I had shown this before, but I went back through my slides. I'm not sure I showed it, but I'll just quickly show it. This is the god Vishnu, a very important, powerful creator god from the ancient texts of India. And he is sleeping on a multiple headed snake whose name is Shesha, and he has a lotus flower growing out of his navel. Okay, so this is Vishnu. He's dreaming the universe into existence. So this is a creation story as well. He's dreaming on the ocean. He's floating on the ocean on the back of this great serpent whose name is Adi Shesha, the, the Shesha Naga, multi-headed cobra snake. And while he's dreaming, he has a lotus flower blooming out of his navel and his wife Lakshmi is uh, at his feet. Oh, and on top of the lotus is Brahma. And then there's Lakshmi at his feet. What, what is this about? Why, why am I bringing this up? Because who rests on top of a multi-headed serpent? Well, that would be Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus, Scorpio. This is definitely evidence that Vishnu is Ophiuchus. If Vishnu is Ophiuchus and Shesha is Scorpio, this is going to help us solve the clue about who's the turtle. Why do I say that Vishnu is definitely Ophiuchus? Well, can you see that there's a flower growing out of his navel? Yes, there's the lotus. And I thought I put this up, and maybe I did, when we were talking about the possible identity of Yotzitzitzo. I said, you know, she's a mature flower. It could be that she's associated somehow with Ophiuchus or with that half of Ophiuchus, the lotus flower half, the serpent head that could be a lotus. But anyway, this is definitely Vishnu. And I think this is Lakshmi by his feet. We can see tending to his feet is his wife, Lakshmi. That's Sagittarius. But the important thing is if Vishnu is Ophiuchus, oh, and then Prama on top of the flower or Brahma dancing up there or foreheaded uh, on top of the flower that's Hercules okay with his square head four cornered head now why am I bringing this up because Vishnu is the god that has avatars you know that movie avatar avatar is actually a word that's special for manifestations of Vishnu Vishnu is a god but he appears in 10 other avatars 10 avatars and the second avatar of Vishnu, the first is like a fish man, almost like a merman. The second avatar of Vishnu is Kerma, the turtle. And I've written a big long chapter in that book that I told you about ancient worldwide system, looking at the ancient myths of India, talking about the avatars. I go through all the avatars of Vishnu and I argue that if Vishnu is Ophiuchus, it's really interesting because all his avatars are either related to Ophiuchus or nearby constellations. And so now I'm going to argue that Kerma, the turtle, is also related to Ophiuchus, which is Vishnu. Vishnu is Ophiuchus. Vishnu sometimes turns it into a turtle and holds up the earth. In India, a turtle holds up the earth. Here's the part of the sky that we were just looking at where we were proving that Vishnu is Ophiuchus, I'm going to argue that Vishnu, when he turns into a tortoise, is still Ophiuchus. And there's a Galapagos tortoise. You can see they have a nice, long, stretched out neck. I've argued this in my 2019 book that I keep mentioning, that that is Ophiuchus. I mean, look, there's a humped shell. If you look at Ophiuchus and think of it as like, oh, the left side is the tail of a turtle coming out of a shell, and then the right side is this, you know, head coming out of a shell, then yes, you're right. Ophiuchus could be a turtle holding up the earth. And there's a snapping turtle. There's a snapping turtle 
they do have long necks, but I guess they don't stick them out that much. I was looking and looking. I spent like hours looking for the perfect snapping turtle. I could never find one. Like if their neck was stuck out, that was all the, that was in the picture. So I had to get the whole turtle. Anyway, you can see his long alligator-like tail. It's pretty clear to me that a snapping turtle is a pretty good match for Ophiuchus, just like a Galapagos turtle is. And that holds up the earth in this story and in the myths of ancient India. Here's, this is a famous scene. I'm not gonna, I'm in the interest of time, I'm almost done, I'm just moving along. This is a famous scene, the churning of the ocean of milk and the pillar in the middle is on the back of Kerma, the avatar of Vishnu. That pillar has two, uh, the, well, it's a serpent. They're playing tug of war with a serpent. What could be the pillar? Well, that would be Ophiuchus again. Obviously, you can see the serpent on either side. They're churning the ocean of milk because Ophiuchus is right next to the Milky Way. This is my argument. I'm quite confident in this. But look at, there's a big turtle holding up the earth. And here, we already saw this in the, my very first presentation I showed you. I was zeroing in on Indra at the top. But here again, we've got Kerma the turtle at the bottom. This is the churning of the ocean of milk again. If you look closely, you can see the tug of war. This is a carving from Angkor Wat. And up at the top, I showed that there's an, uh, a Hercules figure. It's the god Indra. And so there's Hercules up on top of the pillar. So this is abundant evidence that a turtle holding up the earth somehow has to do with Ophiuchus. I'm quite confident about that from other myths. And also right underneath Ophiuchus, as we've said many times, is Scorpio, the multi-headed serpent. And I found this picture from also from India. I think this was drawn in the 1800s. Both Kerma, the turtle, and Shesha, the multi-headed serpent, sometimes are talked about holding up the earth. So the two who can hold up the earth are the turtle, Ophiuchus, and helped sometimes by Scorpio, Shesha, in ancient India at least. But Lupus, if that's the, if that's the beaver, he couldn't handle it. He couldn't hold up the earth, only Ophiuchus. But that became the earth. And then she landed on the earth and she was safe. And what did she start to do? She started dancing. I don't know if this is for sure, but when Yotzitzitzon comes down, she starts dancing. There's the whirling form of Hercules. Hercules is sometimes in that deep lunge position, sometimes in the whirling form. And in ancient India, there's a special form of the god Shiva who sometimes engages in this dance where he becomes Nataraja, the lord of the dance, the king, the raja, of the of dancing or acting and there's this familiar this statue is very famous this type of statue it's the dancing shiva it's called nataraja you can see that whirling form but also you can see kind of the serpent sticking out like like spinning there's serpents coming out all over almost his hair looks like serpents in this so it's a combination of ophiuchus and maybe hercules do I know which one exactly is her dancing and spinning the earth? No, but if I had to, if I had to really, if you had to nail me down, I would say, I think she's up there on Hercules position, dancing on top of the turtle, spinning the earth around, making it grow. And as Trina said, throwing, you know, earth around everywhere to create the world and on top of the turtle. And it's just amazing to me that this is very clear, you know, turtles holding up the earth in ancient India and dancing on top of that turtle in ancient India and in this story. So that is all. Um, I know there's a little bit more where she has the scalloped, um, you know, she meets the one, her daughter meets the one that she's going to marry. And then there's the two arrows and all. I figured I'd go into that, you know, maybe the next time after we hear some more. I hope I didn't go too long. I'm going to stop share and uh, see what you think. Cool. What do you guys think? Oh my God, that's so much. Wow. <laughs> I, I didn't expect to find all that. I was, I was awestruck really by some of those things, especially the part about 
down below will reflect where you came from. And then yeah, yeah. That just blew me away, really. When you were talking about the um, you know, the halfway point mm. where um after he when he says that or when he goes to the halfway point and says um you're gonna go and it's gonna be the same as up here a reflection of up here that the pattern in heaven will be mm. or world or whatever you want to say will be a reflection of where you came from and mm -hmm. that you don't need to rely on my power and he said was it he who said it yeah that you yeah. rely on you have your own power right Yes, so, I think that was Gaha Serena saying that. Yeah, right? So while you were talking about that, this, this is what was going through my mind, is that uh, on a spiritual level, and we, we look at life as you're coming here, it's the journey, it's going to be hard, <laughs> right? It's going to hmm. be hard. An ordeal. Hmm. If, you're, if, if you're very connected in a spiritual way, then you know that life is life is life and life is hard and it's a journey and you have to walk that journey regardless of the ups and downs and the obstacles you got to go around or over and under that in the end you have your own power to make these decisions in this journey that you're here and then as you're here, you reflect on whatever, right? But at the same time, your reflection is always, we're always trying to live a good life or, or make it the best life as possible here. But as we get older, now you, now you look at life in a different way. When you're young, you're very abrupt and whatnot. But as you get older on this journey, and on a spiritual level, it be, it starts to reflect that to you. You start to look, where do I come from? Where What's the meaning of life? And da, 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 so on and so forth, right? So this is all what I'm thinking while you're talking. That was beautiful. I, I, and so, I agree. You know, like it's going to be hard life, but you're going to get through it. Basically, that's the message. That's that's what I got from it, you know, and even on a spiritual level, you're going to get through it. And what we come here as humans, we work through our lives to get to a certain place of understanding as who we are. Right. And that's why we do ceremony. You know, I mean, not every person, but part of doing our ceremonies is part of finding out who we are. And, and what is our purpose and what is our life and what do we have to do here while we're here? So it, it looks to me or I feel that it's like that journey is that reflection of where we come from, what he's saying, it's gonna be a reflection of that, that you have the power to do that. And basically we all do right now as individuals, we have the power to make our lives as beautiful as possible a reflection of heaven if we'd like so this is the creator or the creation of those beings coming from where we come from telling us that we have to remember that this is our journey and we come from that and we're our, the whole journey is to bring back that whole um vision or or the the of the way it was or the way it is that reflection of in the heavens right I don't like using that word, the heavens, but <laughs> that's the <laughs> word we're all using. <laughs> but where we, yeah, so where we come from, the sky world. Anyway, that's how I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but you know what I mean by that part where it, what yeah, he's basically I, what we're doing here as human beings, we're trying to make our lives more meaningful to us, right? Anyway, yeah. that's all. Yeah, and the heavens are a picture, I think, of that the spirit world or the invisible world. But I, I agree with all those things you said. And the other thing, I didn't think of it last night, but today as I was going through the slides and explaining it, and then again as you're talking, it also reminds me, 
very famous passage in the Bhagavad Gita, which is from ancient India again, from Sanskrit. Before this great battle of Kurukshetra, there's this warrior named Arjun, and he's going, he's got all the power to, he's got all the weapons that he needs, he's got all the skills that he needs in the night, but he, but he has doubts. He's, he sits down basically and says, I don't want to do this. And Krishna comes to him and says, the Bhagavad Gita, basically. He says the Bhagavad Gita. It means the song of the Lord. He Basically, Krishna says, well, you're going to do it. <laughs> and the way to do it is this, and that's the Bhagavad Gita. But then the night before this big battle, which I believe represents this life, this battle that he's going to do, we're going down into this battlefield at least in that myth it's it's a battle before he goes krishna says now pray to durga who's a goddess so in in this case it's gaha sarine telling yotsitsitso you have the power in the bhagavad gita it's arjun the warrior the goddess durga comes to him the night before the battle and she says now arjun you will certainly prevail in this battle you will you will be able to accomplish what you need to accomplish it's a he prays to her she shows up durga the goddess and she says you can do it you will be successful you will you will be successful it's it's really similar to what gaha serena says to you know you have the power i think another thing to back up on the your um idea of well, if you could explain the turtle or playing the earth is in a, another story that we have it's basically uh the thunderer uses lightning bolts to keep the horned serpent underground so here i believe in, in that story of course hercules playing being the thunderer from bolts of lightning and scorpio especially as h.a ray puts it with just the horns on it plays the horned serpents and the of course being the land so yeah uh, David, I have a question. What, where, and when I speak to David, where am I supposed to walk? <laughs> I, mean, no, I can't see anybody. <laughs> All I can see is Kyle. Is that okay. Trina asking? Who's who's talking? Yeah, I, yeah, Trina. <laughs> where, where, yeah, yeah we need like 10. We need everybody to turn on their screens and then we could have everybody. <laughs> okay, here's my question. So the Milky Way, so this is, might sound like a silly question, but um, Kyle put it up, you put it up. I'm noticing the Milky Way is blue. So is that a fact? Like, it is it, does it have this blue hue when, when they take pictures? Yeah, I love you. When, and the reason I'm asking if, if in fact the color is blue, when, when science, the scientists take pictures of it, is it blue? Because in the story, Carlos, yeah. not just that, but we're we're at that part where she's where it's saying that she goes, it, she's falling. Gali was she fell for a long time. Mm. Then it says the whole part about Gaha Serena coming along and all that goes on. Then it says she continues to fall, and then it says and that it says it was dark. But then as she continues to fall, all she, she, she notices, all she could see is blue. <laughs> it says, oh, I remember you. Yeah. And it doesn't like, and it because was, that's not necessarily Skyward, but it's known, it's called Beyond the Blue. Yeah, Izzy not Garuya the means on the other I side see. of the blue. Yeah. But, it, but it's very distinct that even before she gets to the water, there, she starts to it starts to go from being darkness no. to the blueness mm -hmm. so so David I guess what I'm I don't know if it's a question or if it's a comment or I'm just saying my thoughts a yeah. lot here is it blue no <laughs> first off if it's blue because when you when you when Peg, I think it was Pegasus and then there's Andromeda I think in that's is, or and then she comes through the yeah there you go yeah Akil yeah and then she comes through and, and she's then, going in that direction and then the turtle and then so and then she starts to approach the blueness mm -hmm. which is the Milky Way so I just is that a question yeah yeah, yeah. so is it David <laughs> Kyle is it actually Milky Way actually blue 
because that great, would explain. Great, great well, observations, Trina. I've never, you know, um, I think this is an important point that I've never thought of that I've never, uh, you know, so when you're asking me, you know, maybe <laughs> Uh, I'm not the I'm not the uh, I'm not the final judge on this, but I I I draw it in in blue there. Um, I mean it it looks like that's the photograph, so or that's the the stellarium. So it's definitely the bottom right part is the brightest part of the Milky Way in between Sagittarius and Scorpio, and it's wider, and it looks more like a lake or an ocean or a widening. And the part up by Andromeda and Perseus is narrow. That's like the, the source almost of the river. So I've never seen, you know, an emphasis on blue in any other myths or sacred stories of other cultures. So I don't have any positive, you know, opinions to offer except to say that's really amazing what you just said. And it's quite possible that as she falls, yeah, that part, that widest part maybe that's the you know the ocean of blue that she has to and and beyond the blue is up like going up the milky way is basically going more towards spirit like that's why ophiuchus connects us with spirit world or with the heavens and so she's coming down <laughs> the opposite way and and down down here uh, it's a great great point i don't know um you know i'm not the judge to say if you know it's a great uh great thought that is there another question or well comment? it's just about the milky i looked it up like you can just google what the color is the milky way now it's oh, really really red. Really um, so it's mostly <laughs> Really, 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 really bright white. Mm -hmm. But when you really, when you split up the light into the actual wavelength of what comes, we just see brightness, right? Yeah. It's a, it's like redder, more red in the middle, and then the arms are like a sky blue. Oh. So, there's the blue again. so which one? Which one? Not the Tika. I don't know. I'm gonna Google. No. <laughs> so just ask the great Googles. <laughs> Another one says, oh, why does the Milky Way look blue? The disk of our galaxy appears blue because it has a large portion of young, hot O and B main sequence stars. So that would explain young the, hot o. if she's if they're coming from that area of the of it, the, the stars as David described it through Pegasus and Andromeda coming towards Ophiuchus into that Milky Way area passing through to go there. It kind of makes sense. What do you, yeah, look at that, just like that. Good job, Trina. Oh, all of us. Yeah, good job, everyone, yeah. You should tilt it a little bit so we could see you better. You're just like down at the very bottom, just little heads. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, your computer's in Oh, yeah. I was really amazed by this whole part, and you know, I didn't know what I would find. So, um, you want to take a break? So, we don't need to kind of review. We could, uh, we did the review, eh? Yeah. Okay. Question because I heard I don't know it too much the story but Hawaii okay I heard a story or they have a story their creation story is a woman that was the what well, was a turtle she was a turtle and she when she hit land she became a woman or she turned the island or something I don't know does anybody know are you, are you familiar with that one David well, about the Hawaiian... Actually, I'm not, um, but that's very, very interesting, and I'm, I'm, you know, I don't doubt it. I'm familiar with Maui fishing up the islands sometimes. The god Maui uh, will will go fishing and pull up an island um, with his hook, but uh, I don't doubt. You know, we've just found two places on Earth where definitely there's a sacred story about the earth being on a turtle 
And so I don't doubt that that is found in many other cultures too, because like I said, there's evidence that this system is worldwide. Like there are stories from the cultures of the Pacific, from the Polynesian cultures, from Hawaii all the way to New Zealand, Aotearoa in their language, that um, I have found definite connections to the same star connected stories in the Bible, the same star connected stories in Japan. Like there's a specific story, I'm actually making a video about it right now, that connects with the Solomon story in the Bible, in a Maui story, and a, Jap uh, a story from the Kojiki from ancient Japan. So that would be really interesting. Um, and that's a, that's a great point, something to look into. I'm not off the top of my head familiar with that one. So we started. Uh, can you give me the post? Uh, back. Yep, coming up. Okay, you want you want to be the host? Okay. Any questions from last week? Do you remember where we left off? Anybody? Where he said he's going to marry her, but he's not going to live here. Yes. Keep going back. That's the guy. Okay, you're, you're That's the point. <laughs> and then I want to share my screen. I'm going to share. And there. Okay, so we'll go ahead. We'll, here we go. So, Dr. Oxer, do you know him? Well, they I got Sir Augin denied two weeks ago. So I I rushed and I and I I I said the wrong title, the wrong heading for part two. So here I fixed it and it and this is actually part two. It's all the same characters. Okay, okay. But it's okay. So it's when the earth was new on the turtle's back. I jumped ahead one to part three. And this is where I fall short. I'm very, I'm very um, pressed for time. And I'm, uh, I guess uh, I get lazy after work when I have a minute and I just came in and I did it real fast and I made it, but here we're fixed. Okay? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so now it's when the earth was new on the turtle's back. Same characters. So last week, last week she falls, she gets pushed, she's, she's pregnant. Everything Kyle and David just said the, the water animals, the birds, the turtle, it grows, she gives birth. She has who? Who does she give birth to? Who remembers the first girl? Yenorines. Because what does Yenorines mean? She leads the group. So you you this in on the second part, we see her, we get we're getting to know her as a grown woman. She gives birth. First one giving birth, first time a birth happens on the earth. It's a female named Yenorinus. Mm. Yenorinus means she leads the group, yeah. the group of human beings who are to populate the earth forward. Mm. So Yenorinus, she she grows fast. She grows, and you know what? I have this. I have, I'm, I'm digressing here. I'm going off track here. I had a I have a, a grand in the cradle before, and he was. Hockey, it was two months old and it was, and I just have to say that. Okay, so now back to the arena. She grows fast. She grows real fast. It says, you know, J, what he does it. And she because quickly, this, it's, it's turtle, birth, earth. She, and now she grows. And now she's at the, the time where she can get, um, become married. So, yeah. Is, a, is grown now and the mother says if, okay if you're gonna if anyone should come to you and ask you to get married you tell them I'm going to decide so for sure this happens she's going about the earth collecting wood and whatnot and she comes upon how many? Asa. 
awesome hardy what you are not there she meets up with three who remember the three the first one turned in what what did he look like awesome did so zahad what he he was all like he was dressed in like yellow and he turned into did so and the mother said no the second one was who a raccoon the raccoon because do you remember the word i don't remember it said it said uh when you hold up when you hold up he had gray clothes but he had the black stripe yeah and he, he then she says no the mother says no and then he turns into the raccoon now the third one what was he the fox so no the third one uh, oh, my God. His clothes were dirty. We, yes we don't know because yeah. we didn't transform anything to, into anything yet yeah. exactly but what and how was it he was dirty and then his cloak he said he had on like a like a cloak thing and it was scalloped on the edge of his cloak mm. and then the mother says to says okay yeah he's the one he's the one and go back and you tell him yeah you can marry him and then and invite him to come so she goes back and then she tells him and what does he tell her I'll come visit you later. <laughs> yeah, I got stuff to take care of first. <laughs> exactly. I'll, first, I got to go, I'll get, I'll prepare. I got stuff to, to take care of. I'm going to come back. And then when I come back, I'm going to just visit you. And when I come back, and then I'm going to like tell you how things are going to go down. And that all has, so now, that's, it. that's where we were at. Yeah. Okay. So now I think it's, we're waiting now because she even goes back to her mom and the mom's like, hey, what's up? Where did he go? I got it. And she said, oh, what's the daughter? He's, he's going to come back. And and so, oh, I thought one was a fox, a wolf, and a bear. That was the in first one. Is he not going to do it? Yeah. So, but on earth, it was the ditzo, the raccoon, and now the turtle. Well, no, we don't have. I gave it a plus to I know. Yeah. <laughs> like, we didn't come the scallop, right? The, the scallop cloaked man. <laughs> the scallop cloaked man. So now she's like, well, where is he? Okay, wait, he's gonna come. And now we're waiting for him to arrive. We're waiting for him to arrive. And now we'll come off the glasses. Here we go. How I thought we are they done a hard there we go Oh, yeah. This one is. give you my arrow all night long. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna get back his arrows. <laughs> <laughs> I can't draw that. When I was struggling, my understanding of action is a representation of like they tell men to, like they need to be careful of their arrows. And it's exactly what you're saying. You know what I mean? It's representative of their men's sexual health and stuff like that, taking care of your arrows. 
not shooting them in the woods and then you don't know where the heck they are. You got to make new ones and all kinds of stuff like that. Same idea. Of no no shooting blanks. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Don't know. I needed a little bit of help there. <laughs> I was trying to like prepare myself for that, but here we go. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just gonna draw that. Anyway, we're down to David's face on. I was gonna say that the myths are never shy. You know, it's like the way the way you read the myths as a child, they usually cut all this stuff out. But when you like actually read them you're like oh my goodness what is going on they're just they're the myths are they lay it all out there okay here we go let's, let's get away from the all night arrow sesh i'm, I'm okay. trying that for my heart let's <laughs> not have it all night long <laughs> Okay. 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 Had a ganyo gardok. It had a a flint that was uh, attached to it, and the other one it didn't have. It didn't have a, a have that. Rodakwarish uh, rodakwarish shuhaje aska negayong mule neyatena deyong the the one that didn't have a flint on it. It was really straight. It was like a straight shoot and arrow. Dini gardi was ya et ya e juni ne ya ya da se ya ya da ya ya da ge wa hara ne de gayon le tanu wa thara ne ga it says so as during the time that the 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 young one the young woman the young female was laying there he placed upon her two arrows and he what thara ne ga like he did that or what thara ne ga or Side by side, like mm -hmm. side by side, eh? Um, was the Gorori a tona yo to hack? Dini was soon this. Tanu dosa amzayerisi, netic or hungen, it don't tre. Tanu ramha on harisi. On sarisi. It said he told her that that's how it should stay all night long. And for her not to remove it, until the morning, it won't be removed until the morning, and that he would actually, in fact, remove it. Zuk yum zahayat on it and uzahat ondi. Then he turned and he uh, he left. He zahayat on it. He went out and he left. Zayorot ne or hum gesti dunda arde ne ruwe danu yum zahawe ne dekayon gire. Zuk eron zare. So the next morning. He came back, the man, and he took back his two de gayon, his two arrows, and then he and then he went off. He, uh, arrows are at there, like he went off. He went. He, he just kind of went away, air far away. she was so happy. And then at last, she noticed that her life force. Had changed the Ahumhe, like in her life, the way her life. So how do you say that in English? The Yahumhe, her life force, her her life, her, her spirit, her, 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 her spirit, her and all of her force of her life, her essence of her life had changed. Ona, ona wa unja dera suioste, or di huio di osigorde onzari wayon onzar. There it is. Oh, her, her mother told her, you have become quite lucky for sure, for a fact, truly you are going to have a baby. 
Yap te gariwis o nagon wa ogon dot ne dieneru. It wasn't too long. She didn't have to wait too long that it was time for her to give birth. Zok wa ogone lago di wa wa ogotun de ne de niyase roditare ye ya ye ya the and then she was she was amazed that she could hear two male beings talking in her body. Sayada jot ulado the one he was always saying oh no sajere oh no sajere ni se no no. The Zatstigafa Dinue Oyunge Oyunkinagerotste Oyuki Oyunkinagerotste. He's always asking, hey, what are you gonna do when we go traveling about the, the place where we're gonna be born? So Sayada Zaharu, and then the other one he would he would say again, Oh god dunque dunyanyu, ayenagere gedi yunzade. He would say, I'm going to create the bodies of those who are going to live upon the earth. And I'm going to, and I'm going to create the bodies of the, the, what, the animals that are going to, how do you say that? It's like they're going to be about going about the earth. Like and I'm also going to create, I'm also going to make all of the things that are going to be supportive of the of their life force here upon the earth, the, the people and the animals. Chat de gahun, okay? Then you chat de gawir, okay? Ne wah, wah yani yuta, ni awa ahun, okay? Then you ne ahun sunun yate. He said, and I'm also, I'm gonna make, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make all of the, um, the like the fields. I'm gonna make the tree, all of the different kinds of trees, the thing, the trees that the wah yani yuta that are gonna. The trees that are going to have the hanging fruits, so nayawa, so that it would be for nayawa ahununheke, so that they will have, it would be able for them to have live. They will be able to live, mm -hmm. uh, and they will have. They will be able to have happiness. Why? Because you know when you're hungry, you're not happy. It's like, but they're going to have everything, kind of like everything they're going to need. He's going to create it so that the people who are going to live upon the earth are going to have everything that they need so that they can have happiness. Yeah. And you, what are you going to do when you're, when you're born, when you, when you, yeah, when you're born. He said the other one, the twin, I'm gonna try to do the same thing. And if I can, I'll just try to do something else. And me too, I'm gonna try to have a say about what's gonna happen about here on this earth. And the, the pregnant one, the pregnant woman, she would just be going along listening the, uh, the, uh, the way that they were talking inside of her body. Sayada, the one, the one he was always asking, oh my god. Like, so what's up now? Like, what's gonna what's gonna happen? Or is it yeah, go ahead when it um I I jadung or the negon uh ka on tajer of the so hey what's happening? What's going on? What's up? Wow, like is it's time, is it time now for us to go out the box? 
go out of this body and go out and and who's gonna be first? And then at that time, that fe the female one, she heard the one male say, Do is a ison. O kni i kokno wadi anga dungo te ye yoga dunda yo swat te dunda yo swat te je. Kokno wadi yon jaga me. He says, like, kind of like, hey, you calm down. <laughs> okay, me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out here because you, it shows that this, like, they, uh, that it's, it, it's, uh, it shows and it's like, it's lit up the, the place to go. This place is where I'm gonna go out. Oya de hakka waharu. The other twin he would say, Yata Yatayas, Yataiza Yanerasta, Doga Ehnuwe on Zadungo de Go or Iwio di Oserio ne you keep me staha. Ona ni ogadungo de. He said the other twin he says, you know, I don't think it's gonna be a good thing if you go out in a if you go out of her in in a different place if you do if you do that for sure you're gonna kill our mother me on a knee me it's fine i'm going to ogadungo then like i'm gonna go i'm gonna go out kind of so and then he was born the Hayagotne, the Wahanagera de Ne Oya de Haka. Ket Garaje wa ihe and then wa di mistaha. It says then, oh uh, yeah, it wasn't long, then, yeah, uh, like here, uh, the other one, he came out of her. And that's where he was born out, the other twin. Ket Garaje wa ihe and then wa di mistaha. And then, it happened that the mother she died. <laughs> so on Istaha, then her mother, what to Adishan in the Dehnika, then her mother, she took care of what to Adishan, like she helped them, she supported, she took care of the twins. Sayada, Ganyo Garoks, Gahele, Ranudine, Ganone Oya, the Sungerane Ungwe. It says the one twin he had flint. Flint was plate was gutted. It's placed. It's on. It's placed on the top of his head, and he he oya desunjera ne ungwe. It's like he looked different than a than a ungwe. Mm. How do you say ungwe? A person, a being, mm -hmm. uh, a, a human. He looked different than a human. Ganaktio tinue yahuadi terune tehnika. And she, the, the, she made a nice place for them to reside, to be, to, to put them there, the twins. So, ono dunda yeri washnetne nagoyerunda ne unda janga danutikan hugar de ya eyo ne agoyerunda. So then at that time, she, she, she took care of the body of her daughter and she placed her, uh, she placed her, she placed her daughter's body by the doorway, by the doorway. Then at that time she said, in 10, 10 days time will pass on and then she'll her life force will come back. Uh and then at for and as of as for the twins, they were healthy and they grew real fast, they grew up real quick. Your snore, what what your dead yard, 
they 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 grew up real fast. Oh, nekne do karani wa ni zera ge wa ni kweni wa kaditar ne ruwa di sota. And it was only a couple of days that they were able to speak with their grandmother. Wa iru ne ruwa di ni staha. So they're young. Are they going to get any design? So the grandmother, she asked them to, do you two know where you come from? Do you know where you come from? And do you know where you're going when you leave this, when you leave or pass this place here, the earth? So like, do you know where you're coming from and where you're going to go when you leave the earth? Then one of them, he responded and he said, Says, I know where we come from. Surely, truth, in fact, like for sure, it's a fact that we come from uh, we come from like on the top of or on the other the top of the earth on the other side of the blue is where we come from. So on 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 top of the earth, but on the other side of the blue is where we too come from. Yeah, no one do. Uh, and I will never forget, it'll never be forgotten. Two handfuls or like this. Um, two hand. I'm gonna use uh dinue ni ni de wagenu of from the place where we come from. Dinue dinu ni de wagenu where we come from. Danu no no yo gahewe ne agadoke ste ne ga yo huza de ton yo ha sege dinue ni jugenenu. And when it's time that I ought to pass of this place, the earth. I'm gonna go back to that place where we come from. When So at that time, their grandmother she said. Obviously, you know when it shows, it shows that you know all of what has what has happened in Yawasar. You are aware of all of the things that have happened. And therefore, I'm gonna I'm going to name you Taru Yawagu. I'm gonna name you the holder of the heavens, holder of the blue, holder of the sky. Because that's how, because that, because you know of the place where you come from. So then the other one, he asked his grandmother, so like, what's so already think about me? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oksa <laughs> Ne de wageta kontina hoda tagwawi ne rage niha. So right away the other one he 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 kept he responded, he said, Hey, I'm not thinking about the place where we came from. 
and I'm not, uh, uh, and I'm not thinking about where I'm gonna go after when I leave this place, the earth. It's good enough that um, it's good enough that I I'm, I'm all right. Like, you know, you know, you know, that that I'm alright. That I'm here. I'm here, man. Like, live in the now. That's kind of what I said. That's kind of what I said. That's kind of what that is, eh? You're the what dog or the what zoha. Oh, and he says it in uh, your it's uh, it's for it's uh, for sure, it's steadfast, it's a uh, it's it's a steadfast issue that you know things are gonna liven up around this place. <laughs> <laughs> And then they went up was you know and for and me I believe in the things my father gave me. Say because him he's made a garden ganyan garden so he that arrow anyway we'll get to that okay. My dad gave me a book stamp Hawaii you the old woman she said he dize tapo or we neyat niha. Said, the grandmother asked, what do you believe in? What did your father give you? He said, He says, he says, I believe in this, this, uh, this arrow that um, this gayon, where the arrow that has the gunyo, that has the flint uh, attached to it, um, and it's a doske, like for sure, wadoga. It's it's a it, obviously I'm gonna use it. No, no, like uh, defend myself. To, yeah, like to defend myself. I'm gonna use it. And that's why I don't like um I don't know. It's it's coming to me in a funny way to say it. It's almost like he says, and I don't I don't really care. I don't really give up. <laughs> like kind of like I don't really give up, you know, about where else I'm going, they that nuwe. So he's really like, oh, what he do you? Zok Ruasota. I speak from his grandfather. That's it. the same vocabulary. Yeah. Zok Ruasota Wahuasonu Sawiskara. So then their grandmother, she named him Sawiskara. Sawiskara is he is flint or he is chert. Chert is a flint. What he so because that's all he's thinking about is that thing the father gave him. What he says he's made of it. He says that that's all he's thinking about. He's gonna use it to defend himself, and he doesn't. He's got no worries. He's got that. He's gonna use that to defend himself, and he doesn't care about where he's going. That's him. This is who I am. So the grandma's like, all right, well then, sawiskara. You're sawiskara. He is flint. He is chert. He is always, oh, oh, I could even sometimes say those shards of ice. So a few days had passed. Again, the, she could hear them talking, the twins. And so whiskara. He said, "Do you know where? Do you know where? Do you know where Ma is? You know where Mom is? He stopped. You know where Ma is? Taru Hiawago do the heart. Taru Hiawago, holder of the the blue, the hot heaven sky. He he said he re, he said back. Waga der yonder de dinet tiago das. I know, I know that she is just there sleeping." 
eto ner sawiskara wasagori wanun du senero sota doga ori huyo zi okti agoda senero ro istaha. Sawiskara asks his grandmother if it's true, if their mother, she's just sleeping. <clears throat> Any questions, comments? Um, that word I wanted to ask you, what is it again? I already forgot now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I forgot it was went past too long. But, okay. but it was the one there, uh, <clears throat> they're living or whatever you said, they're all over. Oh, yeah, anyway. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Them for later, I guess. Okay, keep going. Zahuahrori wa doga di nekti agodas. On zeye, no no yunga hewe. So she tells him, the grandmother, she tells him that it's true, she's just sleeping. And she's going to, on zeye, she's going to wake up when the time arrives. So it's going to Yuri Hawana no Kegane is So Iskara, he says, it's a, of a very important matter. It's what Yuri Hawana, it's a big important thing that I see my mother. Rosota, what Jenny was Zerago, the grandmother, she replied, on ze sega guaganik on zunketsko. You're gonna see her when the time arrives that she's going to. She's going to Onzungetsko. She's going to wake back up. He said, no, like I have to see her so that, I, that my mind becomes, uh, my mind will become fixed, but it's kind of mm -hmm. like, uh, I don't know if it's my mind that rests. He's my mind, mind that rests. My He's my mind. I have to see her. He's right now, God. Yeah. 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 Like, is in the like moment this. right here, what's happening to me? I gotta see her. I got. I have to see my mother. And it was like, well, it wouldn't, it wasn't anyway. Like she kind of thought that it wouldn't be like too bad. It won't be too bad if uh, he saw his mother. So he saw her just laying there and he was like he, uh, He's urging her, like he, he's not just asking her. He's like, hey, hey how's it shaking her? Ma, what's going What's up? How are you doing there? Zokro sutta wa huwa rori. Dogi no yo tuha. Zik yo wa don ni zeri huwe. Ne, aum zayut kets. The grandmother, she tells him, it's uh, togi no yo tuha. It will happen. That the day will arrive where she will rise again. The day will arrive. She's gonna, she's gonna rise again. Me, no big whoop dog. It's like no big deal. I can on all until she wakes up. Me, does it get the gut steady style? Does it? Bother, bother me it doesn't matter it's not a big deal that until she wakes up so whiskara what had they want on the one they had their heart on their heart on their heart on their neck on the tickets go so so whiskara he like puts those words down there and he's like look i'm just gonna wait i'm not gonna wait very long for her to wake up to wake back up I'm telling you no i'm not waiting too long <laughs> he says and because he's he's not having it for something to like bother his mind and i'm not having it it's it's kind of like no 
No, I'm not. I'm not dealing with this. You're not messing with my skull. You're right? not. You're gonna. And you know what? Because it's not gonna bother me then if she sleeps forever. Finally, so turn you all go a hardo. Ak de nu yarn. Tano to ha de ni go la wardiya wardiya. And turn you all. He's like, wait. Peace out. I'm out of here. I'm gonna go check things out. And he goes off. Luwa de ni stama. What do I what do I do? Di ha se ne de nika. She like favors the sayada. What do go on the wahuanoru? Wahuanoru kwe. Dano, what to our fordu? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Oh, she favors him and she like babies him. Almost like she coddles him. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um Okne Oya. What to what there what what to what there what to what there Riapdiko. And that one she kind of like how would you say it looked like Donna? Pick Donna. Yeah. Gone. Which one? Um, the opposite from what you think. Yes, she picks on. Uh, she picks. picks she picks on the other one, and she picks on, on the other one. one. Yeah, well, ladies, yeah. There, no, see, no. is that how smart we are? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, we already did that. She picks on. Gone. Oh yeah. Gone. Oksa. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Who got that there? So it would say like gone, like the. All the time or gone, it would be that when that one he would leave, she would like she would say she would say stuff about him. She would um gossip about him, like kind of she the one would leave and she would gossip with the other one about him. Well, who are already in a sawiskara? She got me go ha kokro di kwayo. She told sawiskara. That they only had a little bit of food. And so that they should eat when his brother leaves. When the brother's not there, when he leaves, then we only have a little bit of food. Me and you, so is we're gonna eat. <laughs> And Taru Hiwagu would always just get what was left, the food that was left over. That's what he would eat. Dehona Dehona Dona Serra Garia Ze Ona. So Wiskara was so good at one who said Nero Sota, Doga Aundu Ne Ahua Oyuni, Ne Aundu Ahadurata. So their food supply was like getting short. It was cutting. Their food supply was getting cut short. And so Sawiskara, he asked his grandmother if she could make him a bow that he could use to go hunting. So she tells him that she would make she would only make him a bow and an arrow, and that he shouldn't share it with his brother. So when Taruhiawagu came back, he asked Sawiskara, where did he get that? Um, uh, on uh, that um bow, so whisker up. No, uh, on uh, yeah, oh, so whisker as a whole glory. Oxuta, what would you? So whisker said, My grandmother ate it for me. <laughs> What's the <laughs> whisker? <laughs> In that, see, even that too, he was like, Oxuta, my grandmother. Mm, right. My grandmother made it for me. Was a gori was a gori one do sota. Doga go on do round only a Hawaiian. 
So Tarun Yawag, when he asked if, if in that he had asked his grandmother to make it. Yeah, Tarun Yawag asked the grandmother if she would make him one, and she wouldn't hear of it. Zan, and she said to ask her brother, go ask your brother to borrow his. She, so she tells him, no, go ask your brother to borrow his. And she's fully aware that it's gonna cause friction between them, and and it's gonna it's gonna cause them to to fight like. Ne it's the ohondu tua rori ne sawiskara ne dosa da haden da hadeni hade because she she told sawiskara before that he shouldn't he shouldn't share it with his brother. Questions? Yes. What? Yeah, what time? Oh, it's already nine. Okay. Uh oh, are they gonna have a fight? <laughs> no. <laughs> I wanna um, who um who is the like sort of the bad one? Uh so so whisker. So whisker he's, he's, he's the one. Well, is it really bad? Like we don't know if he's bad yet. It's just saying he's different yeah that's the one with the flint the, he's yeah, got yeah. flint on his head and when she when she asks them do you know where you come from the one the one she names Taruhiwago, he's like yeah i know where i come from and they walked on again he's like it's almost like he's saying he has part of him part of what where he comes from he has part of it with him and it's on the other side of the, the on the top of the earth on the other side of the blue and that uh, he, he's gonna go about this earth, he's gonna do this, he's gonna do that. And when, when his time is done, he's gonna go back there. And then when she asked the other one, he was more like, yeah, yeah we are not really concerned about where I come from or where I'm going. I'm concerned with right here, right now, on what my father gave me, which was that, that it says that, remember the two arrows, one yeah. was straight, one was crooked. And, one was and, straight. and it had the flint, mm -hmm. the straight one had no flint. So him, he was more concerned of like right now, the mother, the mother, the mother was dead. And he's like, where's my mother? I gotta see my mother. It says like my mind is like, is not appeased. I need to see her. So does that make him bad? You know what I mean? His mother's dead. And, and he's like, I just wanna be appeased. I'm only concerned with what's here right in front of me. You see, I but I can't figure out why why the change of the whole grandmother, like who is Yozitsu, right? Yeah, why she would like intentionally try and make her grandchildren fight and favor outright. Like what where did that change come in? Oh she my god, made... I have an answer for you, and it's like so simple to me. Imagine all the stuff that she went through. Uh -huh. She's got lots of like, oh, she's on her own, man. And she's got a lot of trauma. Lots of trauma. trauma. <laughs> and now, and now, her only daughter is dead. Right. She's grieving. So when you have a lot of trauma, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of grief, and you have and you have no support, <laughs> it causes you to do some crazy what the mm -hmm. yeah. I've also heard that in the story that. When she either overheard them talking or the grandmother actually asked them who killed their mother or what happened or whatever like that, that so Wiskara blamed her that it was his fault. I've heard that, but mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. Yeah, that, yeah that's 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 some other that yeah. picked some yeah. of the other. That was like a more direct reason. Well, it's your fault that I don't have a daughter. It's your, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that one is kind of yeah, and those other burdens are talking. Uh, and she's asking which one Lisa, and okay. they're, they're blaming each other. Uh -huh. and, and in the end, she she picks Charles Garland's story. Yeah. And then yeah. she actually, the one where she actually takes Tariya Wangum and throws them into the weeds. Yes, yes, yeah. She threw them out into the woods and which is, her, like yeah. crawling after them. So, with them. You know, in a lot of these ancient mythologies has a child like Moses yeah. in the in the reeds, in the 
So it, there's some similarities there as well. Mm -hmm. So is that what they did with the Spartan school? Like they were showing up yeah. with the Well, the there's the uh, same thing in the uh, Seth. No, the Cyrus. I believe the Cyrus was putting the casket by on a river by in the reeds or okay. something like that. So, yeah. so it's, it's a very similar uh, theme. Well, there's some details we're going to get to that we didn't get to yet, and it's going to keep it's going to keep unfolding for you. Yeah. Okay. But at at this point, at this point, here's a woman who was downfended. She was downfended and she was coddled, and then all this great responsibility is put on her to make a new whole dimension of life become manifested from spirit to physical. She does a lot of this stuff on her own. First time she has sex, it hurts. The dogs lick it off. The guys that go back to your mom's and she's like, she's all it is. All, and then all this stuff, she's got lots of heaviness that she carries, a lot of trauma, you know? And at this point, at this point, it's starting to show itself but it's gonna the more it's gonna unfold you'll see because her daughter's still just laying the, by the door over there and it gets it gets worse and you're gonna and, and it could be too like that maybe she looked at she's grieving and she looked at Tarunyawago who's like yeah I'm okay if I don't see my mom it's so and the other one's like I want my mom mm -hmm. So it's, it's like familiar. making her think that yeah. one loves the mother more and her yeah. mom was selfish That's or only thinks of yeah. herself or something. So kind of like, yeah, shuns him because of grief. Yeah. I, think I know if my daughter grief. passed away, I'd be freaking out. Yeah. 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 But like, one's not performing grief the way she expects it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So it's yeah. like a bigger understanding. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. It could be, yeah. Oh, okay. Go, go ahead. Okay, we're gonna stop here. David, Yawa, Yawa.